Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News Desk. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Limle. Coming up this morning, Kolebu Renal Dialysis Unit remains closed to outpatients in spite of a directive from the Ministry of Health for the unit to be opened. We'll hear from the ranking member on Parliament's Committee on Health who is demanding an immediate opening of the facility. Also this morning, all is set for the much touted and anticipated NPP November 4 presidential primaries. Your election headquarters, as usual, is gearing up to bringing you a comprehensive coverage beginning this evening. You want to stay with us for all you need to know regarding tomorrow's event. South African mission to Ghana insists their country is safe as the visa waiver agreement comes into force. More from her in the wake of recent attacks on some Ghanaian nationals there. Last congratula congratulatory messages continue to pour in for the GJA Journalist of the Year, Erasmus Asari Donko, as Angel Specialist School International is the latest to, up, to join others in appreciating the multimedia reporter. We have all of these plus business coming up shortly. Many thanks for choosing us. Ghana's dialysis crisis attracted parliamentary attention Thursday. In fact, there was a bipartisan call directed at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital to immediately reopen the outpatients department of its renal unit. Delivering a statement on the floor of the House, ranking member on the Health Committee described the hospital's closure of the facility as unconscionable. Parliamentary Affairs uh, correspondent Kwekwa Sante has more. A frantic appeal to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital to reopen the OPD of its renal unit to save lives. Already, the Renal Patients Association says a dozen of their colleagues have died following their inability to access healthcare services. According to Minority Spokesperson on Health, Kwabina Minta Kando, government must intervene to get the facility reopened immediately. Parliament as a whole should be deeply concerned about the persistent closure of the renal unit outpatient department at Kolebu Teaching Hospital. This situation has far-reaching implications for the well-being of dialysis patients in Ghana and raises serious questions about the commitment of government to transparency and accountability in our healthcare institutions. In the initial case of the facilities closure was attributed to scarcity of essential medical consumables required for dialysis. When dialysis medical consumables were finally procured, the service saw an unprecedented increase in fees from 380 Ghana cities to 765.42. The Minister of Health and the hospital administration must, as a matter of priority, address this situation. The denial of essential healthcare services is a severe violation of patients' rights and a breach of public trust. We implore the government to work diligently with the hospital to, rec to rectify this situation and uphold its commitment to providing accessible and affordable healthcare service to all citizens. The paramount objective must be the prompt reopening of the renal unit outpatient department and the provision of essential subsidies to ensure that healthcare services are accessible and affordable for all citizens. This call has found support from the majority leadership. I fully associate myself with the call for the Minister to be programmed to appear. That is something we cannot compromise on. He must appear. And especially in a matter about the lives of our citizenry, we can't take for granted. It can happen to any of us. And so, I'm fully associated with that call. It's about the lives of our people. Whatever it takes, he must appear. We must program him to appear and to brief us. Immediately, the Kolebu Rena unit should be open immediately. And there are some other actions that have been taken. That is why I'm emphasizing the call. As we, go, we need you to bless this call that the minister should be programmed to come and make this statement formally on the floor of parliament. He can't sit in his ministry 
and engage the media and make this statement. He must come to the representative of the people and make this statement formally in the House. The Speaker has since summoned Health Minister Kikua Jiman Menu to appear before MPs on this urgent matter. To come and brief us on the closure of the renal unit outpatient department and the upsurge of kidney-related problems in Ghana. I mean, the minister should come and tell us something. I mean, almost everywhere, people are talking about the kidney-related problems. He should come and tell us if the NHIS issue can also be captured in relating to uh, kidney-related issues. I mean, he should come and tell us and to the extent the whole nation. So that is my directives. The Renal Patients Association says its members and other kidney patients are dying and more will die if government does not impress upon the Kolobu Teaching Hospital to reopen the outpatient department of the renal unit of the hospital. This matter has become a big matter on the floor and in a rare show of bipartisan unity, MPs on both sides have been asking the health minister to intervene and get this unit at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital open. MPs say that while citizens must do their best to protect themselves of kidney diseases, those who already have contracted sex diseases must be protected by the state. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. <music>
and who know what they are about. Thank you. Meanwhile, Chairman of the MPP, Stephen Tim, is appealing to all aspirants to put the interests of the party before their own interest and rally behind any candidate that eventually emerges victorious. The way forward for us to deal decisively with the widespread indiscipline, apathy, and general indifference, indifference in the party. I want to call specifically on the four flag bearer aspirants to commit to working as a team to ensure victory, even if they fail to win on Saturday, rallying by rallying behind the eventual winner. In all, over 204,000 delegates are expected to cast their ballots across all 275 constituencies dotted across the country. All eyes are fixed on the outcome of this election. Already, the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, has been tipped to win the elections. However, the margin is not certain. Reporting for Joy News, Samuel Mbura, Alisa Hotel, Accra. Now, our founder and leader for the Movement for Change, Alan Kwejo Chermante, has challenged members of his political movement to help ensure his victory in 2024. Speaking at the registration of volunteers for the movement in the Ashanti region, Mr. Chermante said, ending the continuous rule of both the NPP and NDC will bring some significant change into Ghana's governance system. He says the political fortunes of the country have remained significantly low due to the economic instability spearheaded by the NPP and the NDC. Nanabuachi Adam has the rest of the story. The Independent Political Group Movement for Change, led by former Trade and Industries Minister Alan Chamatin, is poised for victory in the 2024 presidential election. On Wednesday, November 1st, 2023, the movement took to the streets of Kumase to register volunteers to help in their campaign to secure victory. Speaking at the first volunteer orientation and registration in Kumase, leader of the movement, Alan Chematin, charged members to help put an end to the over 30 year rule of both MPP and NDC. <laughs> Ghanaians say the 32-year rule of NDC and MPP has not yielded any positive results. Now, 32 years of the history of any country is very significant. And yet Ghana, and China, and China, the person who has said it took China less than 30 years to transform from one of the poorest countries into the second biggest economy in the world. 30 years. And in me and I saw me catch it all. And so what has said it is time for change. Mr. Chematen is optimistic of forming the next government come 2024. Movement, you know, the copy may be kindly say, we want to move Ghana beyond the duopoly of NDC and MPP. Yeah. The movement wants to move Ghana beyond the duopoly of NDC and MPP. We should all bring our minds together to rule the country. Communications team member for the movement, Hope Senadoye, says the first step of registering volunteers has yielded positive results. He says over 4,000 members have been registered so far. It's a movement. I mean, everywhere people have been activated and they are calling every day in and out that they want to be part of it and we show them how to register. Even yesterday, yesterday, just uh, uh, within... Uh, two, three hours, they registered 4,700 people around KJTR Adum area. Just yesterday, 4,700 people. So we should tell you the willingness of the people to join the movement. And I don't see it as a, a, a party structure where you need to go through bureaucracy 
and all those kind of things. So it's going to be spontaneous and uh, people, you know, the enthusiasm of the people will just move the movement like a, a bushfire. Mr. Chamatin is expected to begin his campaign across all 16 regions of Ghana in the coming days. For Joe News, Nana Bwache Dankwa Yadom, Kumase. Well, on your election headquarters, uh, we will be bringing you nothing but a comprehensive coverage uh, as usual. Uh, we have reporters across all the constituencies who will be bringing us live updates on all the happenings on the ground and as and when they happen. Our coverage, however, starts this evening and I am joined in the studio by Deputy Head of our Political Desk, Winston Amwa, for a brief conversation. Winston, are we prepared for tomorrow? Very prepared, Aisha, and as you indicated, uh, starting tonight at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., everything you need to know. You know, we've always done uh, the election eve analysis, and so we're starting tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, this time around, uh, you know, it wouldn't be only Evans and uh, I. We have been joined by Raymond Aqua. And so you can expect in-depth analysis. As always, you can expect, uh, you know, the data to speak. You know, the NPP talks a lot about data. Mm -hmm. And we've gathered the data to let the data speak and would interpret the data, build the trends, do the analysis for you to know what you can expect tomorrow when the NPP goes to the polls. Okay, so I, I want you to break it down for me of, I mean, on what to expect tomorrow. You, I mean, you should expect in-depth analysis. First of all, you, you need to have the coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everything that happens in the elections, you can trust us to bring it to you. So we're starting the coverage from 7 a.m. We're finding out what is happening, have the materials gone to all the centers. And so from 7 a.m. I'll be here with Evans and Raymond. And then at 9 a.m. you'll have news. So by news, I would also be going around the country, be finding out how the voting processes is going. Once news file is done from 12 noon, we're going to be joined by former national chairman of the NPP, former campaign manager. You know him. I mean, once I've mentioned all of these, you yep. probably know whom to expect. Yep. He'll be joining us from 12 to 2 p.m. Mm. And then from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., we're joined by the director of research mm -hmm. at the office of the president, okay. right here in the studio, to continue mm. the conversation with mm. us. And once we get to 4 p.m. till the results are declared, we'll be joined by Minister of uh, Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs, Stephen Asamoah-Boating. And with all these persons in here, with our reporters asking the critical questions, with our uh, you know, correspondents on the ground bringing us everything you need to know, with our team of analysts also in here, uh, it's obvious this is the only place that you can be on your election headquarters mm. as we bring you a 360 coverage of the NPP uh, presidential primaries. So tonight you'll be um, setting the stage for tomorrow, yourself, Evans Mensa and Raymond Aqua. Yeah. Um, tell us what to expect. <laughs> well, expect, um, you know, um, in-depth analysis, expect um, insightful analysis, expect uh, what you may not have heard before. And so what I have done, I'll just tell you what I, I mean, what I have done is that from now to, um, I, yes, I've seen the research, okay, yeah. I've seen the research, mm. but I'm not going to look at it again okay. until 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. You know why? Mm -mm. You also need a bit of a surprise element. So I've asked people to do other things for me, yep. which I will only see on the day. Okay. And so what that means is that once you're seeing something that for the first time, it brings everything that you know. This is not just about coming in there and planning a well choreographed something. Mm -hmm. No, we have done all the analysis already, but also expect a surprise. Okay, so the surprise elements. You have nowhere to stay, but your election headquarters on the Joy News channel, we have it all covered for you from this evening till uh, the results is declared. Let me say that your election headquarters is sponsored Brought to you by Petrosol, your clean fuel in full quantity. Always a delightful experience and the new force, a new nation. And it's supported by the new force as uh, also a sponsor of election headquarters. Petrosol and the new force are the ones bringing this to you. The new force a new nation. Let's get on to other stories. A law lecturer at the Gimpa Law School, George Bafua Sarifri, has made a strong case for a supranational government within the West African sub-region to pursue a common agenda for the good 
of the people. Key among his proposal includes the establishment of a common market, a single currency, and a common central bank for security and economic independence. Speaking at a workshop series at the Gimpalo School Thursday, Mr. Sarefri said a supranational government is the surest way uh, that the sub-region could become industrialized and compete with the EU. There's more in this report. The court should also have the power to issue binding judgments and orders that the commission or other mechanisms can enforce. Three, developing a common market and a monetary union for the region by harmonizing trade... Mr. Sarefriye was speaking at a workshop dubbed giving ECOWAS a teeth, a case a of supranational government for the West African sub-region. He called on contemporary African leaders to commit to the cause of a sub-regional government by ceding off part of their sovereignty for the realization of a supranational government. Various governments have to cede some of their sovereignty to this body. This is because I'm of the opinion that ECOWAS does not have the teeth to bite. So regarding most of these policies, they are not able to implement. Beyond the potential economic benefits, Mr. Asarefriye believes security architecture of member countries will be strengthened if they are successful at implementing a sub-regional government. Fostering a common foreign and security policy for the region, coordinating diplomatic actions, positions, and representations among member states on sub-regional and international issues and establishing a common defense and security mechanisms that can respond to threats and threats as well and challenges to peace and stability in the sub-region. He says the countries might as well scrap existing blocks if they are unwilling to pursue a sub-regional government. And we do not get rid of this by having this supranational organization or supranational government to see to the enforcement of the various policies that we have, the various protocols, the various treaties that we have, then it's better we just scrap ECOWAS. The next step for Mr. Sarefriye is to make copies of the presentation available to the ECOWAS Commission and other relevant organizations. The South African mission to Ghana insists the country is safe as the visa waiver agreement comes into force. There have been many xenophobic attacks in the past with many prospective travelers fearing for their lives. More recently, a priest was attacked and kidnapped. In spite of these, the commission to Ghana says the country is safe and is encouraging Ghanaians to take advantage of the 90-day visa waiver. Michael Ashali's report read to you. This is a day for the South African mission in Ghana as the much anticipated visa waiver agreement kicks in. Deputy Ambassador to Ghana Tando Dalamba says this is a significant step for both countries and a step closer to making Africa borderless. So we are entitled for 90 days to be in South Africa. How you use those 90 days, it depends. Oh, it depends on you whether you use it five days, 10 days, 20 days, then but it must be 90 days in a year. I think other African leaders will follow suit, but it's within the AU agenda to have borderless, you say, continent. He explains that with the right documentation, any Ghanaian can travel to South Africa for at most 90 days without a visa. It's a valid etiquette, a valid passport that is six months you see that is valid for six months before you apply um, the yellow fever certificate you see like in any other country even here in Ghana when you come the immigration officers and police at Kotoka I've experienced it a series of assaults on foreign nationals often termed as xenophobic attacks have been reported notably in the week prior to the agreement launch a Ghanaian priest was kidnapped and subsequently released after several days. Security stands as top concern for many contemplating a visit to South Africa. Deputy Ambassador to Ghana, Tando Dalamba, assured the country is safe. 
Uh, in our minds that uh, this thing is going to happen, our police together with the Ghanaian authorities, they will make it a point that the pastor is back. Yes, South Africa, it's safe. But like in any other country, I'm not trying to defend the question of whether crime or not. Like in any other country, when you visit, you take those precautionary measures. And another thing, criminals. They take advantage of the situation at times, you see. Like in any other country, they will take a situation. But we are like to appeal to the Ghanaians, when they go to South Africa, they must really, really take precautionary measures, not to travel alone, to travel in groups at least. I think it will be safer in that way. So where should you visit in South Africa? And what should you do as well? Head of South Africa's Tourism West Africa, the Kizo Rokolo Jane, has some ideas. So the waiver has an, 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 an enormous impact on the two countries. One thing that I can guarantee you, your entry point is Gauteng in Johannesburg. So already I can tell you there's a lot more things to do. I'm from Soweto myself. So you do not want to miss Soweto. Go and find out where Nelson Mandela's house was. Desmond Tutu, go and meet the Sowetans in their hometown. And you might be you know, lucky to meet one or two Ghanaians there. Trust me, a lot of Ghanaians do visit that part. Go to the apartheid museum, you know, go to Sun City. The commission hopes that both Ghanaians and South Africans will not overstay their welcome. Erasa Sasaridonka, the reigning GJA journalist of the year, continued to bask in glory for his extraordinary work that have won him the Desirous Awards at the just ended Ghana Journalist Award. The multimedia journalist spent some time with some students and staff of the Angel Specialist School International Atema community 12 where he educated them on the ills of illegal mining he used the opportunity to call on the students and teachers to become ambassadors for the fight against illegal mining and their communities my colleague Lucia Daiquating has the details It was a resounding welcome for multimedia's Erastus Asaldonko, the GJA Journalist of the Year 2022 at the Angel Specialist School International at the Tema Community Tour. The meeting was to appreciate the exploit of the award-winning journalist, especially in the area of illegal mining. On behalf of the school, Irene Drew, Head of Primary and Programs Coordinator, congratulated the multimedia journalist for the outstanding achievement. Erastus Asaldonko Multimedia Group for winning the PAV and some journalists list of the year. Take it, take it, baby. It's a privilege to have a great journalist amongst us. Addressing the gathering who were full of admiration for his works, Erastus narrated what motivated him to take up the dangerous challenge of exposing ills of illegal mining. We also get poisonous chemicals from mining. Some of those uh, chemicals are mercury, arsenic, cadmium, lead. You've heard of them, right? In your science class. But they are very poisonous if they should get into your system. God, in his own wisdom, buried them deep within the earth's crust. But when we mine and we use excavators and heavy equipment, we bring them all up. And so when the wind blows, we see the dust around. Some of them carry heavy metals. you never see there was also the viewing of the award-winning documentary poison for gold where students were allowed to ask questions later we sought to find more answers deep inside the greens of chifu kotochi and chifu etimogwa old town in the chifu etimogwa district of the central region excavators are digging deep in my question is what can we do to help campaign against the calamity you know, words spread very fast. So you start spreading the word. That's what you can do. So tell your parents in the house, today we watched something, a documentary on illegal mining. It's affecting us. And ask your dad, what can you do to stop it? The program's coordinator explained to Joy News how the school intends to join the fight against illegal mining. So the campaign is hashtag stop illegal mining. The school is going to champion it, it's going to spread the news. We are going to see how we can 
affiliate this to our global perspective project so that we spread the news tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend some students shared what they have learned and how they will support the fight against the menace i have learned that illegal mining or galamsey causes harm to mothers and unborn babies it causes their children to have deformities when they are born like some of them don't have genitals and that is really harmful i'm going to help my school start a campaign against illegal mining so that we can save the lives of children and mothers in this country we want to um, create this movement to help other people learn about illegal mining so hashtag stop illegal mining Erastos Asaridongo says it is his plan to educate young ones on the dangers of illegal mining so that they become ambassadors for the war against the menace. We see a direct report for Joy News. A member of parliament for Dafiama Bosie Isa constituency, Dr. Sebastian Sandari, has lashed out at government for deliberately refusing to fix the Dafiama Dashi Sanwe Road. The road was among some major roads in the Upper West region that was washed away by violent flash floods in 2021. He says that the Roads and Highways Minister, in answering a question on the roads in parliament, promised to fix it in two weeks. Dr. Sandari observed not an inch of construction work has begun at the site, causing the death of two persons and scores injured. He has therefore called on government to come to the aid of the people. The Dafiyama Dakia Sangwe Road was among major roads that were cut off on August 12, 2021, by violent flash floods in the Upper West region. 15 million Ghana cities was allocated by the government to fix the affected roads in the region. Construction work on the emergency roads were awarded to four contractors who they all executed and opened to traffic in less than a month. The Dafiyama Dache Sangwe Road that linked the community to other parts of the Dafiyama Bure Isa district and the Giriba municipality were however left off from the emergency projects. Residents are now left to their own fate. Member of Parliament for the Fema Bure Isa, Dr. Sebastian Sandare, Chesai's Roads and Highways Minister, Kusi Mankwata, and Upper West Region Minister, Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, for using a helicopter to have an aerial view of the area without touching down to see the deleterious effects of the flash flowers on the people living on the ground and under squalid conditions. They did not touch down to even see for themselves the problems of the people. So they never got to this part of the Fiamma, this part of the road. And they left. Whatever temporary intervention that came, this route was not considered. They did the Somba one and the middle one and left so since august 2021 meaning it's more than two years there has not been any intervention by government for this route to add insult to injury there are no road signs to alert motorists and drivers about the danger on the road the feeder roads people that are in charge whether they have come or not at least even if the road is not being worked upon we expected that there should be some signs this is a very dangerous spot that there should be some signs to indicate that authorities are aware that it's a dangerous spot so when you are coming and you get to this place be careful but as we can see and as your cameras can capture if you are not familiar with this road you may you may you may run straight into any of these big holes and two young men two young men of this village fell inside this water and perished because of the bad nature of of, of the road almost every week somebody from somewhere falls inside here get wounded 
and treat it. Dr. Sebastian Sandara said he has never relented on his quest for the road to be fixed, penciling the various officers that he has been to, including the DBI District Assembly, Federal Department, and also posing an agent question in Parliament for the road minister to respond to. The Minister for Roads and Highways, in answering my question in Parliament, gave me two weeks that within two weeks government was going to work on this road it's been more than a year two years so two weeks have turned into three years and i want the minister of roads and highways to now see me i'm at the very point the very location that my question in Parliament was talking about. Since the violent floods floods 26 months ago, economic activities and healthcare delivery in the area has grounded to a halt, whilst attendance of schools by pupils is erratic. Parents who wish to have their children at school on rainy days have to swim them across the road that has now turned into a valley. Farm produce are also locked up at the farms as a result of the Omotorobo road. We passed through here to go and treat ourselves at the upper hospital. But because of that, people find it difficult to cross, particularly in the rainy season. Also, here is a very busy farming community. How to transport our produce to go and sell at the market is another challenge. Our students are not spared. So if there is a, any heavy downpour, the children cannot go to school and it's actually affecting every aspect of our life. Mind you, work on the other major roads were completed within a month and open to traffic, but this road hasn't seen an inch of play of work by any contractor. The people are however wondering whether this road was deliberately neglected by the government or was not part of the 50 million Ghana cities allocated for the fixing of the emergency roads. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam, Dafiema. We're still live on Joy News Desk. We'll take a break. When we return, we'll bring you more. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the business segment on Joy News Desk with me, Pius Kujobaka. In an era of rapid technological advancement and increasing competitiveness, businesses are being urged to be innovative in order to sustain their organizations. According to the chairman of Vanguard Assurance, Daniel Iwadakun, businesses must be innovative in order to sustain the operations and withstand risks. He was speaking at the Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies Annual Business Conference. The annual business conference brought together distinguished business leaders and experts. The program was to help share invaluable insights and their wealth of experiences. Chairman of Vanguard Assurance, Daniel Iwada, said, with the many challenges faced by businesses, being innovative is critical to remaining afloat. And that was when actually Vanguard became a very, because we were like little rats coming out of every hole. Everywhere you turned, you saw a car coming and it was, there was Vanguard on it. There were moving targets. And that's when we really became a household name uh, in insurance. So that was, that was something that I also uh, learned that you have to do things sometimes out of the box and in a different way and not put, uh, not, uh, put signboards everywhere which was stationary, which people had to go past, but you could have actually moving signboards. Today, like the world has changed and you have to keep on getting on innovative because the moment you go on, uh, online, pop-ups start coming at you and everything is changing now. So in, a, in, a, in, a, in business, you have to keep on thinking ahead of the curve. Chief executive of Type Company, Kobi Asma, added that businesses must continuously pursue value addition in order to grow. So here we are, we see companies on the path to grow, making sure that they can add value to what they do and scale. Um, so the meaning of growth and uh, scaling depends on what perspective you actually want to have, even after the pandemic. Uh, I see the pandemic was just not enough. We were also visited by another scale of economic crisis in this country. 
So change the, the whole definition of making business sense of what everybody was doing. The conference was held under the theme Balancing Wellness, Growth and Legacy, the Complete Leaders Conversation. President of the Ghana National Tailors and Dressmakers Association, Joanna Ishan Mensa, has urged the public to patronize made in Ghana clothing in order to boost the fashion industry. Speaking at the start of the 12th Biennial Conference of the Association, she said, although the cost of living will decide on which clothing to buy, clothing made in Ghana are better and have the tendency to last longer. Joy News' Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports from WA. The five-day 12th Banner Conference of the Ghana National Tailors and Dressmakers Association, GNTDA, brought together members of the association from the 17 local grants regions of the association in the country. Ahead of the main endeavor, slated for Saturday, they have kept themselves busy holding many activities and competitions that include sewing contest, quiz, and reports reading. To announce their presence in the Upper West region, they embark on a float, spilling all principal suites in the World Township, singing, dancing to music from those speakers, kept on top of a trailer and addressed in the end by the national president of the GNTDA, John Ishan Mensa. Well done, congratulations. We thank you so much. The banner conference of the GNTDA is being held on the team, creativity, innovation, and finishing recipe for good designing in the 21st century. John Asian Mensa underscored the importance and contribution of members of the situation to the national economy. Actually, we are doing a lot. Uh, it's quite unfortunate that there are a lot of inflows of second hand clothing. But thank God, Ghanaians have come to understand that we should wear um, we should wear made in Ghana clothes. So the mindset of going for false and those stuff is sort of going down. When you get to yards, you can get something good to wear. So people are coming back to our clothing, and this is boosting our markets. That is what we do. That is what we use to pay our bills. That is what we use to even. That is it. We even pay tax to support the government in a way. So so far, though, after the COVID, things have changed. But we are still on it. We are praying for the best. See, Ghanaians to patronize made in Ghana clothing to boost the fashion industry. I want to tell Ghanaians today that yes, I know the cost of living may influence what you want to wear. But what we make in Ghana here lasts longer than those things. So please patronize in made in Ghana clothing to boost the fashion industry. Reporting for J News, Rafik Salam. Wa And that's it for business. I am Pius Kojo Baka. More after this break. Welcome back to Jury News a Desk. Two South African nationals, Dr. Jane Kopa and Dr. DeWitt, have embarked on a motorcycle journey from Pretoria, South Africa, through 20 African countries, including Ghana, to Madrid, Spain, to raise awareness and funds to deal with the security a scarcity of portable water in rural African communities. Having covered over 10,000 kilometers so far, the duo arrived in Ghana and have been interacting with students of Achimota School, emphasizing the importance of community service. Carlos Coloni has more. Dubbed Expedition H2O Ride for Water, two friends, Dr. Jean Cooper and Dr. DeWitt Osterson, started a 16,000-kilometer motorcycle journey from Pretoria on September 16, 2023. They are traveling along the west coast of Africa, passing through about 20 African countries, including Ghana. Dr. Jean Cooper, an organizational psychologist and the chief people and culture officer at FinTech Company, Direct Transat explained that the objective of the journey is to create awareness of portable water scarcity in deprived communities and raise 3.2 million rand towards building over 100 portable water storage facilities in Africa. So we started Botswana, Namibia, Angola, DRC, Kabinda, Congo, Cameroon, Nigeria, 
uh, Benin, Togo, now we are in Ghana. So for this journey, we intend to, we say, if we journey 16,000 kilometers, we intend to raise 200 South African rands per kilometer. It's 3.2 million rand, which will be enough to install 100 rainwater tanks that can give water to 4,800 people. Met on arrival in Ghana by the Deputy Minister of Education, John Tim Fojo, the two visited and interacted with students of Achimoto School. As an acclaimed emergency medicine doctor from Wangaratta in the Australian outback, Dr. DeWitt encouraged the young Achimoto student not to get distracted by the current obstacles but should remain focused on their goals. We had a great opportunity here at Akimoto to interact with the students, um, to hear their questions as well, and their interests and their, their passion with um, what they intend on trying to do with their lives and future and stuff. For us, one of the biggest things is on, on this trip is keep on going. There's lots of obstacles, stuff you can't plan for, um, the same as in, in life. And what's become quite apparent is that these students are also experiencing obstacles and problems and trying to kind of work through that, keeping your eye on the end goal, um, focusing on that rather than just getting blinded by the problem right at the moment. Commending the two for their life impacting journey, Deputy Minister of Education John Tim Fordway reiterated the government's commitment to improving STEM education in the country. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics emphasis is, is something that that we are very excited about. The Minister for Education, Dr. El Seduchum, has that as his priority. And interestingly, what motivates us is that the President, His Excellency, Leonardo Danko Kufuado and the Vice President themselves are inspiring us to change the face of our education system, place emphasis on STEM, and ensure strategically we're able to have 60% STEM and 40% humanity at tertiary. And so that we, we, we are very Poised on ensuring that right at um, teenage years, right at the younger years, we have the skills of biomedical engineering, aviation, uh, computer science, computer engineering, creativity, critical thinking, and invention imbibed in our students. Some students of Achimoto School also express their appreciation to the duo for their impactful interactions. In every walk of life, you need to put your head or put your eyes to the goal and not just forget about the obstacles around you and you'll be well off to go. That's what I'm taking off from this amazing meeting. The duo is leaving Accra for Cape Coast to Madrid, where they hope to raise 3.2 million rand to support the water project. Carlos Caloni, Joy News. And that's how we wrap up the bulletin this morning. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Uh, log on to myjohnline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the... <laughs> For all the developing stories on Joy News. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. See you again at 12.